Support WrestleTalk! Support each other. Hello all, it is I, Chopper Pete. Ollie has requested a day off today, and being the benevolent son of a gun that I am, I'm here to do the news today for you, so you get me today and tomorrow, you lucky, lucky people. Now dance, Ollie. Following AJ Styles being buried at WrestleMania 36 by The Undertaker in the Boner Yard match, he was unceremoniously brought back to Raw just a few weeks later, even taking part in the Climb the Corporate Ladder Money in the Bank match. It wasn't long afterwards that Styles was moved over to SmackDown to compete in the Intercontinental Championship Tournament, which he ended up winning. Reports from the time suggested that Styles and then Raw Executive Director Paul Heyman did not get along. Perhaps. Heyman suggested that the world was round or something. Styles was reportedly angry over the firings of his OC buddies Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson as part of WWE's Black Wednesday in April, despite them featuring during the aforementioned Boneyard match at WrestleMania 36. Styles reportedly felt that although it was Vince McMahon's decision to have them released, Paul Heyman could have fought for them to stay more and didn't. On a recent Mixer stream, is Mixer still a thing? AJ spoke to his fans, also known as the AJ community, on these rumours and pretty much confirmed he didn't like Heyman, but denied his move to SmackDown was over Gallows and Anderson's firings. When it came to the rumour about Paul Heyman and me being upset with him because he didn't take up for Gallows and Anderson before they got released, that's not what it was at all. Not even close. I'll give you a snippet of what me, Gallows and Anderson already know. He's a liar. Now you know. I'm sure you've heard that before if you go back to his ECW days, you'll hear that. He's a bold-faced liar. So I was also teased that a lot more about the situation would come out on Gallows and Anderson's Talk and Shop podcast once they were legally able to talk about it once their 90-day no-compete clauses were up, which is in less than a week's time. Talk and Shop is about to become the new Talk is Jericho. Gallows and Anderson's 90-day no-compete clauses expire on July 15th, and they are heavily rumoured to be appearing at Impact's Slammiversary show on July July 18th, so expect a shoot-heavy podcast episode to be coming out before long. To steal a Michael Coleism, changing gears now, it seems the plans for this year's SummerSlam have been all over the place, taking place in Boston, taking place in September, Septemberfest. But the reports are that it will now be taking place on Sunday, August 23rd, and it'll be at the Performance Center. Glad we finally got that sorted. Unless... PW Unlimited are reporting that WWE is passing around two different ideas to run a WWE Network special the week after SummerSlam on August 30th. These two ideas would either be a second night of SummerSlam, separating the show out over two weeks, meaning a Raw and SmackDown would be in the middle of SummerSlam, or the return of the all-women's pay-per-view, Evolution. The report goes on to say that the pushes of Sasha Banks, Bayley, Asuka and the like are no coincidence, as they're all building towards Evolution 2. Yeah, that's what it is, nothing to do with Ronda Rousey, Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch all being gone from the roster. Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful chimed in to say that he had also heard of plans for a show on August 30th, but hadn't been told any details beyond that. The first Evolution took place in October 2018, and featured Ronda Rousey, Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch in very prominent roles. With all three of them not being available for the show, it seems unlikely that WWE would consider running the event at all. However, another report from WrestlingNews.co is stating that former Impact World Champion Tessa Blanchard may have signed with WWE and would make her surprise debut at the show, with one source telling them that if she did sign with WWE, her signing would likely be kept quiet to avoid spoiling the surprise. But while the main roster may be gaining a new star, they may be missing out on four major NXT ones. At this week's definitely not counter-programmed NXT Great American Bash Night 2 main event extravaganza major global event from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, okay, maybe not that last part, Keith Lee dethroned NXT champion Adam Cole after his 403-day reign as the brand's top champion. Rumor has been rampant for a while that once Cole dropped his NXT title, that would be the telltale sign he was on his way to the main roster, with or without his Undisputed Era buddies. However, there may be some complications 
with that, as Tom Colohue of Sportskeeda reports. According to Colohue, Adam Cole and the entire Undisputed Era have been offered a place on either Raw or SmackDown, with many believing that they've done all they can on the NXT brand. The plan would be for them to be brought up around SummerSlam time, but it may not be as simple as that, because not every member of the group is eager to have that happen due to an urge to stay in NXT. The current plan from WWE officials is to reportedly move up the faction as a whole unit. However, there is apparently still some convincing to do. It's possible that one or more members would be left behind on NXT due to a concern that the move from full sale to the Performance Center taping schedule might create an increased risk of COVID-19. The Undisputed Era have been top stars on NXT from the moment they arrived on the brand. And while they would no doubt be missed on the gold brand, it could perhaps open the roster a little and allow some other stars to shine. Adam Cole has already been seen on the main roster during NXT's invasion last year for Survivor Series, where he pinned Daniel Bryan clean and there was a double DQ against Seth Rollins, but we don't need to talk about that. Would you like to see the Undisputed Era on the main roster? Let me know in the comments, because I'll be replying to people from out of Kyle O'Reilly's air guitar. One of the draws for the definitely not counter-programmed NXT Great American Bash Night 2 Extravaganza Tag Team Turmoil match to determine the best tag team in the world, okay, maybe not that last part, was the fact that there would be limited ad breaks throughout the broadcast. As seen on the show, there were far fewer ad breaks as a whole, and much more picture-in-picture style breaks when when there were ads. The main event of Keith Lee versus Adam Cole didn't have any ad breaks at all. According to Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio, USA Network officials made the call for limited ad breaks, not WWE. As NXT was going up against AEW's Fighter Fest Night 2, USA reportedly made the call in an attempt to usurp AEW's program on TNT. It was noted on the Observer episode that it was very clear that this week's edition of NXT was all about winning the ratings and not about making money from advertisers. But it's not a war, guys. They're just doing their own thing. They don't count a book. <laughs> don't know what you're talking about. So did the limited ads work? Yes. Kind of. For the third straight week in a row, NXT won the Wednesday Night Ratings War, beating AEW with their second night of the definitely not counter-programmed Great American Bash to determine the World Cup Greatest Royal Rumble Horror Show at Extreme Rules Stomping Grounds Time to Kick Ass and Take Names. Okay, maybe not all of that. With 759,000 viewers, while AEW brought in 715,000. Both shows are down from last week, and the demographic story was the same as it's been since the start of the war. AEW won every demo bar one, including the all important 18 to 49, while NXT won the over 50 category and this week the overall viewership. But it was one of the AEW tag teams that competed at Fighter Fest Night 2 that have found themselves in some hot water. Thank you for being awesome pledge hammers on Patreon, the lunatic John Moxley's fringe, and he can last Sean for longer than you in the ring. There are perhaps two less controversial words in the wrestling language than Jim and Cornette. From his rather childish Twitter feud with Dave Meltzer, his thoughts on popular AEW wrestlers like The Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela to name a few, or being fired from NWA for making racist remarks, needless to say, he's not the most popular person within the industry. Which apparently is a sentiment shared by many in the locker room of AEW, as revealed by their latest signees Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler of FT. The pair did an interview on Cornette's podcast recently, and speaking with Kenny McIntosh of Inside the Ropes, it got them some awkward looks backstage. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned Jim Cornette because we did the Jim Cornette podcast, and man, the next day that we walked into the, uh, actually it was uh, it was in the uh, the hotel where all the AEW wrestlers were staying, and you could have, yeah. you know, the scene in the movies, the typical scene in the movies where the record scratches <laughs> and everything stops, and everyone stares at you. That's exactly what Super happened. Super awkward silence. Yes, yeah, so awkward. They were all so mad at us uh, because we did Jim Cornette's podcast, and that's okay with us. We don't care. We're not, you know, if we make friends, we make friends, and we have made a few. Give us the heat. But, yeah, but if, if they want to get mad at us because we're trying to make AEW a better place uh, and make it more money, then 
we welcome that. When Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler left WWE, they revealed their new wrestler names along with a video calling themselves The Revolt, which got them into some legal issues with current independent team, which has been using the same name for many years. Wheeler and Harwood have seemingly dropped all references to The Revolt going by their AEW run so far, where they are only going as FTR. And according to Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio, WWE have also stuck their legal or in, sending the pair legal letters that prevent them from naming their finishing move the Shatter Machine. FDR had tried to trademark Shatter Machine back in February, but were clearly unsuccessful, as they've been calling it the Good Night Express, a reference to popular tag team the Midnight Express since joining AEW. Though the Good Night Express does sound like someone who's struggling to remember the name of the Midnight Express while they're intoxicated. Oh, you know, that tag team, uh, the, 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 the Good Night Express. FDR were also unsuccessful on night two of AEW's Fighter where they teamed with the Young Bucks in a losing effort to the Lucha Bros and the Butcher and the Blade. Also on that show, Taz brought back the FTW Championship and handed it to Brian Cage, who from this point forward will be known as FTW Champion. Which is really hard for me who wasn't familiar with the FTW Championship in ECW and thought Taz had just made Brian Cage the for the win champion. Curse you millennial language. This brought up a lot of questions from fans on how AEW were allowed to do something that originated in ECW. ECW back in 1998, seen as though WWE bought the ECW name and everything that went with it back in 2001. PW Insider have since revealed that that's because ECW and Paul Heyman never owned the copyright on FTW, as the whole thing was Taz's idea for a storyline when Shane Douglas refused to defend the ECW championship against him. Taz holds the copyright on the name and the design of the belt, and it's been in his possession since the title was retired at Living Dangerously 1999. And before we get out of here today, we wanted to send our love and support to the McMahon family today, as Stephanie McMahon has revealed her grandmother, Evelyn Edwards, passed away at the age of 93. Evelyn was the mother of Linda McMahon, and Stephanie posted on Twitter, last week, my 93-year-old grandmother passed peacefully, surrounded by people who love her. One of the last things she said to me was, let there be love. Love is what heals us all. To anyone who is hurting or struggling, I send my love to you. R.I.P. Mima, thank you for everything. You can watch Luke and Ollie's review of AEW Fighter Fest Night 2 with that awesome eight-man tag by clicking the video on the screen right now. And Laurie Blake and Adam Blompier review NXT Great American Bash Night 2 that's definitely not counterbooked and all the other names in the video on the screen below that. Please click both of them. I've been Chopper Pete Quinnell. You can follow me on Twitter at Pete Quinnell and at WrestleTalk underscore TV. And that was wrestling.